so with that, I am going to turn it over to Jeff and let him get us started. Thanks, Sam. Um, our guest today, Jay Wexler, is a professor of constitutional law and religion and law, among others, at Boston University. He is the author of numerous books and articles, including Holy Hullabaloo's A Road Trip to the Battlegrounds of the Church-State Wars, When God is Not Green, A Worldwide Journey to Places Where Religious Practice and Environmentalism Collide, and just last year, Our Non-Christian Nation, How Atheists, Satanists, Pagans, and Others Are Demanding Their Rightful Place in Public Life. In addition, he also finds time to be an avid Supreme Court watcher, which he documents using his Twitter handle at SCOTUS Humor. Professor Wexler, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, thank you so much for everybody who is uh, tuning in, for, for, for tuning in. Um, I, um, you know, it was, this was supposed to be a conference talk at the, at the national conference, and it's, uh, it's sad that that had to be canceled, but of course that was the, the right call. And, and this is uh, kind of, in, in some ways, it, it, it's not better, but but you can have many more people, I think, tune in. So there's kind of an opportunity here uh, to reach uh, a lot of people, and, uh, and I'm glad that that a, that a good number of have tuned in. And what I'm going to do tonight is basically talk about my book, Our Non-Christian Nation, which is here, uh, which I published in uh, June of last year. There's going to be a paperback uh, coming out this September. And I'm going to talk about what that book's about. And I'm also going to update it with a couple of things that have happened since the book came out as well. So, uh, and I think this will, uh, it's all should be of interest to anybody who identifies as an atheist uh, or just has a general interest in separation of church and state issues or religion and public life, uh, all the things that I'm interested in, in uh, writing about and teaching about. So, the book grew out of two kind of straightforward facts about the United States. And the first fact is uh, that in the past 20, 25 years or so, the Supreme Court has really taken down the wall between church and state. Uh, not that the wall between church and state was ever gigantic or anything. There was always ways to get over the wall or through the wall. But in the last 20, 25 years, the Supreme Court has, has taken the Establishment Clause, which is the part of the First Amendment, religion clauses that deals with separation of church and state most directly, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really reduced or minimized its importance. It used to be quite important to the Supreme Court, I think, in the 80s. It is really no longer that important to the Supreme Court. And, it, and it's interesting that the court has not struck down any government policy or government uh, law on, under the, the Establishment Clause since 2005. So, um, the, the, the cases that are most important to what I, uh, what I want to talk about are cases which involve religion's access to public life, particularly its access to government property, government institutions, and government money. And in all of these areas, the Supreme Court has issued decisions in the last 20 or so years that have uh, allowed religion to have much more uh, ability to take part in public life than, than maybe it used to. And so there are four different areas which I want to talk about tonight, which I talk about in the book, in which this has occurred. The first involves government funding of religion, government funding of religion. There used to be an era in the Supreme Court where the, where the Supreme Court would say, some kinds of government funding of religion are okay, others are not okay. The distinctions were very uh, questionable maybe in some cases, looked a little silly, uh, but they, but I think that they were meaningful. I think the Supreme Court used to really care about trying to figure out which kinds of government funding of religion were particularly pernicious and which were not. More recently, though, uh, the Supreme Court has basically come up with, with clear rules that allow religion to, uh, to be funded by government money. So there was a case, a very important case here from 2002 called Zellman, which involved the Cleveland Voucher Program, where the Supreme Court held that is basically constitutional for uh, for a city or state or whatever to run a school voucher program and give lots of money to parents who can then use that money to, to, to send their kids to private schools, including religious schools. And that's even true if almost all of the money turns out to go to religious schools. If every, every parent decides to send their kids to a religious school as opposed to a private secular school, which is what 
is usually the case in these voucher programs. So the government can fund religion quite a bit. And as we'll talk about a little bit later, I think more in the question and answer period, uh, yesterday the Supreme Court issued its decision uh, in a case called Espinoza, which makes it not only okay for the government to fund religion, but in fact requires the government to fund religion whenever it's funding other private schools through a sort of voucher or scholarship program. So we can talk about that since it's hot off the presses and uh, and uh, I'm sure of interest to, to, to many of you who are watching. So that's the first, funding government funding of religion. The second situation involves what we call legislative prayer, uh, which is a bit of a misnomer because it it, it what, what legislative prayer refers to are is the practice of beginning a government body meeting with a prayer, whether it be, or an invocation, whether it be a legislative session or even a town meeting, uh, a small town board meeting. The, the case that, uh, that, 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 that held this was called Town of Greece versus Galloway, and it came from, uh, it was 2015, involved a small town near Rochester, New York, and the, that town board started every meeting off with a prayer, and the prayer was almost always by a Christian, and the prayer was always very sectarian. It talked about, the prayers would always talk about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, not just sort of some kind of uh, generic re reference to a God, even though that's not particularly good either, but these were prayers to Jesus, and um, and a couple of people, an atheist and, and, and a Jewish woman, sued and brought the case to the Supreme Court and said, this is unconstitutional, and the Supreme Court said, uh, it's fine. You can start your start off your meetings with a prayer, um, and the prayers can be as sectarian as as you want, and it doesn't matter if there are 20 people in the audience and 15 of them uh, are non-believers and actually want to have the the town board in 10 minutes vote on their zoning variance, which you might uh, 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 predict would cause people to maybe feel like they want to participate in the prayer or not want to, but have to participate in the prayer. The Supreme Court said it's fine. But, but interestingly, the court, Justice Kennedy also said that when the government is creating a public uh, kind of invocation program, it, it has to uh, be a non-discriminatory program. In other words, it can't limit those uh, who are praying to Christians. It has to open up the prayer program to, to anybody roughly, who, who wants to give an invocation. And this, as I'll talk about later, has given rise to a whole movement of secular and atheist invocations, uh, which have spread across the country, but which are also in jeopardy because of some uh, lower court ruling. So I'll talk about that shortly also. All right, so government can fund religion, government can start its meetings off with a religion. Third area that I talk about in the book that's really important, I think, is the is the Supreme Court set of holdings that say, if a public school opens up its classrooms after school to uh, to uh, activities, either you know student activities or community activities, the Republican Club, the Democrat Club, the you know the lacrosse team, the Scrabble Club, et cetera, it must allow religious organizations to use those rooms and, uh, and property also. So these this, the, the big case here is called Good News Club, and it involved these things called Good News Clubs, which are basically, proselytizing clubs that try to convince seven-year-olds, sometimes a little older, 11, 12, uh, to believe in the Bible. And they are now not just allowed to use public uh, 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 it, property, but they're required, uh, the public schools are required to allow them to use that property uh, after school if they allow anybody else to use the property. So basically, uh, Christian groups can now come in and proselytize to young children within the public schools, after school. So those are three uh, areas. And the fourth and final area is involves religious monuments and displays on public property. So the Supreme Court has this thing that's hanging by a thread called the endorsement test, which says that the government can't put up religious symbols or allow people to put up religious symbols if that would if that would be an, a, an endorsement of religion, if it would be understood by a reasonable non-believer as the government uh, endorsing that religion as the truth. So uh, the idea is that maybe you shouldn't be able to have a crash with Jesus and the baby uh, on public property during the Christmas season. And the Supreme Court did hold that once. It held that you can't have just a plain crash with nothing surrounding it 
uh, in, on government property. But there's another case, which is uh, which I talk about in the book too, called Lynch, in which the Supreme Court said, if you have a crash around Christmas time, but Jesus is surrounded by elephants and candy canes and reindeer and some other sort of secular elements, then it's okay. So the government can put up a lot of religious kind of monuments uh, on public property. Even though there's this endorsement test, which I just mentioned, the, the court in its application of the endorsement test has often upheld the government's attempt to place religious monuments on public property. So the Supreme Court has said that, the, that a Ten Commandments monument sitting right on the Texas state capitol grounds is constitutional. I could try to explain why that is, but every time I try, I just I can't do it because it makes no sense and it doesn't come out of my mouth right. And then last term uh, in the Supreme Court, the court held that a 40-foot cross uh, in Maryland uh, was constitutional, even though it was on government property. The idea was that this was the government claimed a, uh, and it was a World War I monument, which just happened to be a cross. Um, now, those of us who are not Christian, uh, who are atheists like myself or Jewish, um, like I used to be, um, have a really hard time understanding why a cross, a 40-foot cross, is not, according to the Supreme Court, a religious symbol, but that's what the court held. And I, I actually went to the uh, to the oral argument in that case and watched it because I'm a masochist, I guess. Uh, and I just I watched the justices debate whether a cross is really a religious symbol or not. And it was just uh, it's extraordinary. But anyways, that's what the Supreme Court has held. So first major fact about the United States is that the Supreme Court allows lots of religion into public life. Second major fact about uh, United, about life in the United States is that at the same time all this is happening, religious diversity is increasing in the United States significantly. Uh, more, fewer and fewer people identify as Christian. The numbers are always subject to kind of legitimate squabbling, I think, but the numbers go have gone from like 90% to 70% say that they're Christian. Lots of people identify as religious minorities, as Muslims and Jews and various other things, and of course, uh, more and more people are identifying as not believing in religion at all. Either they're believe, saying that they're atheists or other kind or other type of secularist, or simply just don't have a view about religion. That number is increasing. It's something like 25%, depending on the poll and the question that was asked. But it's significant. And so what you have then are these two phenomena where you have more religious diversity, lots of religious minorities, uh, and still the government is allowing lots of religion in, uh, into public life. And of course, the plaintiffs in all these religion cases are Christians who want to put up crosses, who want money for their Catholic schools, who want to start off their town board meeting with a Christian prayer, who want to have the good news clubs in the, in the schools. And so we have all this Christianity in public life at the same time that we have fewer Christians in the country and more people identifying as minorities. So those are the two facts that gave rise to the book. I've been watching this, these two phenomena for the 20 years that I've been teaching, even longer uh, since I was studying religion before, uh, before even going to law school. I have a degree from a divinity school. I went to a Catholic high school, so I'm interested in religion. Uh, I was one of the seven Jews who went to the St. John's Prep uh, my year, but we can talk about that in Q&A if you want. Uh, in any event, the question that gives rise to the book is what should religious minorities, including atheists, do in a post-separation of church and state society? That's the problem uh, that I see and what I wanted to address uh, in the book. Margarita. Now, there are three possibilities, three choices of what uh, minorities could do in, in, in this new situation. One is, they could continue to fight in the courts for more separation of church and state. Um, keep bringing cases in the lower courts, try to go to the Supreme Court, and sort of use all of their energy to sort of roll back the Supreme Court's separation of church and state establishment clause decisions. That's the first thing they could do. The second thing they could do is sort of do nothing and say, we've lost. It's a post-separation of church and state society. We're minorities. We don't want to partake in public life. I guess we'll just retreat and cede the public square to Christians. Or the third thing that they could do, minorities, we could do. I'll uh, include myself uh, as a as a as an atheist who grew up Jewish, who also has some inclination to Taoism and other Asian religions. But anyways, 
Um, the third thing we could do is we could ask for equal participation. In other words, we could say, well, all these cases are about Christians and putting up Christian monuments and making Christian prayers before meetings, et cetera, and having Christian meetings after, after school in the public schools. But, but the Supreme Court has also said that the government can't discriminate on the basis of religion when it's opening up its funding and its institutions and its property to religion. So one thing atheists and other minorities could do is say, hey, we want to take advantage of these decisions too and have our own clubs, have our own monuments, have our own displays, start off uh, legislative bodies, uh, uh, meetings with a an inv secular invocation or an invoca or a Wiccan invocation or something like that. Now, when I first started writing the book, it was 2015, and there was uh, uh, this election that was going to happen between Hillary Clinton and this other guy, and um, everybody kind of thought Hillary Clinton was going to win, and if that had happened, I, you know, I would have been in this position where I would have had to say, the government, what, what religious minorities should do is kind of keep fighting in the courts because presumably Hillary Clinton would have put on uh, justices on the Supreme Court who were more uh, inclined to separation of church and state. But of course, uh, the other guy won, and then he put these other people on the court, and now the chances of rolling back the separation of church and state cases that the, that this court has. In, uh, decided in the last 20 years seems extremely unlikely, at least for the next decade, two decades, who knows how long that's going to be. So the fight in the courts is no longer really viable. I mean, we have to do it, of course. We have to fight, and on the margins, there are important cases that we can win, and people at Freedom from Religion Foundation, American Atheists, American Humanists uh, Association, American Separation of Church and State, uh, these are great institutions that I uh, believe in deeply, and they need to keep fighting, and that's good. But we also have to recognize that there's only a limited amount of progress we're going to make in the courts right now. So that's why I argue that re with the remaining two possibilities being either cede the public square to Christians entirely or uh, demand to take part in public life alongside the Christian majority, we ought to do the latter. And that, uh, that is what the book is really about. It's how we have done the latter and why we should do the latter, the latter being participate in public life alongside the Christians. So um, let me say here, first of all, that this is kind of a hard hump to get over, hump to get over uh, for religious minorities, because we're used to thinking that the public life should be secular and that all religions should sort of be private affairs. I mean, not that religion can't take place in public, but that it shouldn't take place with on government property or using government money or in the context of government meetings. And so the idea that we as minorities, as, uh, uh, as Wiccans, as atheists, as Satanists, et cetera, should be partaking in public life is a hard kind of pill to swallow, I think. But the argument that I'm making in the book is that that's what we have to do. Because we're not going to keep making progress in the courts. And so it's really our, right now anyways, our only good option. So, uh, and not only is it our only good option, there are some advantages to it as well. Uh, I, I talk about this in the book. For example, I think that partaking in public life, like for example, giving an invocation, uh, giving a secular invocation before a government meeting can be experienced as incredibly empowering for a religious minority. And I'll tell a story about that uh, a little uh, in a few minutes. Um, I also think it's kind of energizing for minorities. I think it sends a good message that we believe in religious pluralism and that the government should adopt religious pluralism. It's also potentially a, a good thing from the perspective of educating people who don't know about minority religions, who think atheists, they must not, uh, you know, uh, you can't be good without God, so atheists must be bad. If the atheists can participate in public life and explain to people who don't know really what an atheist is or what an atheist believes, that in fact atheists are, uh, are uh, believe in moral uh, you know, behavior and, uh, and, and, and rules of ethics and all those uh, things that we believe in, that might be a, a good educative project and maybe even could result in more toleration or, or mutual respect or social peace, although that's an empirical question uh, we don't know really the answer to. I'm just sort of hopeful, uh, maybe because I'm just an optimist. Um, so anyways, what the book is about is describing 
for the most part, is describing how religious minorities, including atheists, have in fact uh, taken part in public life alongside the Christian majority. Um, and so I give a, a lot of examples uh, in the book of how we have done this. Um, atheists, Hindus, Wiccans, all sorts of religious minorities have asked to give invocations before public meetings, before legislatures and town boards, and in many cases have been able to, to, to do that. There have been uh, somewhere, I think, between 100 and 200 atheist or secular invocations that are, have been given in the last few years before town boards and legislatures. Um, I could talk uh, about the Satanic Temple, which is uh, uh, an organization which is centered in Salem, Massachusetts uh, at the moment, which um, venerates Satan as a symbol of uh, a rebellion against government authority in the Satanic Temple and their leaders, uh, including Lucian Greaves, uh, who I talk about quite a bit in the book, have led a movement to to uh, engage Satanism in public life, which is, uh, it's always interesting to see how the Christian majority responds to that. So there have been satanic invocations. Um, the uh, religious minorities have asked for money from the, from the government. There are lots of, uh, for example, Muslim voucher schools, not lots of Muslim voucher schools, but some M Muslim voucher schools and other religious minorities have, including uh, Hindus and, and Buddhists and uh, Scientologists and others have asked for and received government money for their programs. I talk a lot about how uh, secular groups in, in the Satanic Temple have begun, and Muslims have begun their own um, after school groups to sort of compete in a way with the good news clubs that are participating, that are using public school facilities. Uh, the, the, the Satanic Temple has their after school Satan program or ASS, uh, which has not been all that successful, but has certainly uh, made it clear that there are reasons maybe why we shouldn't have religion taking part in, uh, in public schools. Uh, there's the Secular Student Alliance, which uh, I'm a big fan of. I went to one of their conferences in Columbus, Ohio, and watched them talk about how secular students can start their own groups, both in high schools and in colleges. And then finally, on the on the symbols, monuments, and displays uh, issue, there have been a lot of uh, atheist displays. Freedom of Religion Foundation has been successful in putting up their Christmas uh, time displays up in uh, in state houses. Uh, Wiccans have put up their displays. There's the Atheist Bench in Florida, um, which I think is great. Um, you know, it's uh, the atheist uh, monuments are always uh, are, are are meant to be useful, so that that's why it's a bench, right? So you can sit on it, right? Unlike a crash, which you can just look at, or unlike, for example, the Satanic Temple's Baphomet statue. Actually, the Satanic uh, Temple's Baphomet statue you can sit on. This is not the actual statue, it's a replica. The real one is 10 feet tall and it's in Salem and I have sat in it. So so uh, there's that. Um, so there's a lot of participation by religious minorities in public life and I think that's a good thing. Now, sometimes these attempts uh, go well, other times they don't go so well. And that's another thing that I talk about in the book. And so this will be kind of my last point, which is to just tell you a little bit about how these attempts at partaking in public life by religious minorities have been received by the Christian majority. So sometimes they have been received decently well, or at least the story turns out to, to be, have a happy ending. So I'll tell two of those stories, uh, which are my favorite stories in the book. The first one uh, involves uh, Linda Stevens, who is uh, an atheist who lives in, town of Greece, in the town of Greece, the place where that Supreme Court case came from. And she was one of the two plaintiffs who challenged the town board's practice of starting it, uh, its sessions off with a Christian prayer, went all the way to the Supreme Court. Like, so she sued the board It went all the way to the Supreme Court and she lost five to four. But then later she asked if she could give a secular invocation before that same board. And they had to say yes. And so they did. And so I went to Rochester, New York to watch her uh, make do this incredibly courageous thing, I thought, which was to stand up before the board that she had just sued all the way to the Supreme Court and gave a secular invocation. And I, you know, I mean, part of me was kind of like, I wonder if there's going to be some controversy that I could report on, but there wasn't any controversy. In fact, the town, uh, the people in the town meeting were very respectful. I like to tell the story about how uh, the, the only thing that actually happened of note was the guy who's sitting next to me 
took his hat off uh, when the town board chairman said, we're going to have a prayer now. And then when Linda started talking about how she was a humanist or atheist, uh, he, he put his hat back on because it wasn't really a prayer. But he was quiet and he was respectful as everybody was. So I think that was a great story. And these invocations, these secular invocations are really great because they're, they give uh, atheists and other, and other uh, humanists and others the, the, the ability to speak for two to three minutes to a captive audience of, part of civically engaged people about what it means to be an atheist or a humanist. Uh, and so, so those are, that's a really uh, uh, great story, I think. The second great story I tell um, is about the Wiccan Pentacle and the fight to get the Wiccan Pentacle approved to be put on National Cemetery headstone. So um, if somebody's buried in the National Cemetery, they, they have a headstone and they're allowed to put a religious symbol of their choice on that uh, headstone. But, the, but at the time, about 10 years ago or so, When there was a Wiccan who's, uh, who, whose uh, husband died in Afghanistan, wanted to put a Wiccan pentacle uh, on her uh, on her husband's uh, headstone, the VA had not approved the Wiccan pentacle at that point. And when she asked them to approve the Wiccan pentacle as an, to be an approved symbol, they gave her the runaround. Um, and it turns out the reason was that the president, George W. Bush, actually didn't like witches. And I can tell that story more if you, if you want to know about it, but it's actually documented. Um, and so the Americans United for Separation of Church and State sued. And then it, uh, in discovery, it became clear that, that the reason why the VA had not uh, approved the Wiccan Pentacle was because it didn't like witches, at which point it was clear that the government was discriminating on the basis of religion, and the VA folded and approved the Wiccan Pentacle. And now there are at least eight Wiccan Pentacle, uh, eight headstones in the National Cemetery which have Wiccan Pentacles on them. Uh, and I visited them, and uh, it was just kind of a very moving story, I, I felt. Now, so those are the good stories. Now. But there are plenty of stories where the majority uh, in the courts, mostly the majority, uh, acts, reacts very badly to religious minorities trying to partake in public life. So atheists give invocations and members of the, uh, of, the, of the committee or the town board leave the room or turn around and face the back of the room or give a counter Christian invocation afterwards, for example. Um, displays of Christians, uh, displays of Wiccans and atheists have been struck down. I mean, have been torn down uh, uh, and destroyed. There's this uh, horrible uh, story about uh, Louisiana legislators who wanted there to be a voucher program in the state until they learned that there were Muslim schools and that Muslims were going to actually get money from the state in addition to Christian schools. And then they kind of rescinded their support for the voucher programs. And then most problematically, and this is sort of a new, fairly new development, it's kind of new from uh, after the book came out, a number of jurisdictions, including the United States House of Representatives, the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, and a county in Florida, have basically uh, excluded atheists and other secularists from giving invocations before town meetings on the grounds that it's a prayer that is supposed to start the meeting. And while the Supreme Court said you can't discriminate on the basis of religion when you allow or invite people to give that prayer, uh, atheists are not religious. They're not invoking divine guidance. And so it makes sense to exclude them. Uh, from the prayer practice. And two circuit courts, the DC circuit, uh, in an opinion by a judge, very liberal judge who I worked for many years ago and have great respect for, except for this opinion, uh, you know, struck, said that that practice was okay. It was okay to exclude atheists uh, because the Supreme Court had said legislative prayer is okay and prayer is inherent religious. So why should they have to include an uh, uh, atheist? The, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals in Pennsylvania uh, and, and some other uh, New Jersey, Maryland, um, has said the same thing. And uh, not Maryland, I'm sorry, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, the Virgin Islands, um, uh, has said the same thing, that it's okay for, for towns to exclude atheists from their uh, invocation programs. I think this is a really big problem because it undermines the ability of religious minorities, particularly atheists, to partake in public life alongside the Christians, which is the saving grace the only saving grace, the only silver lining in the cloud of establishment clause decisions that the Supreme Court has handed out over the past 20 to 25 years. So that's uh, a battle that's going on in the courts now. It may end up in the Supreme Court before uh, too long, although there's nothing imminent there. Uh, but it's a problem, and uh, and I uh, and uh, you know hope that we can continue to fight against that in the courts and. Um, and in other places. So I think that is uh, my talk.
that's what I wanted to say off uh, uh, up front. And now uh, I'm would be delighted to uh, to talk uh, with Jeff about you know whatever it is that you'd like to talk about, and then open it up uh, and talk with the, the whatever questions the audience might have that I may or may not be able to respond to, but I hope I'll try my best. Uh, and I look forward to our conversation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. That was uh, very clarifying. I'll I'll start the questions off with a, a general Supreme Court watcher question. Um, yeah. What is an R number? <laughs> oh, well, you started off with a question I don't really know. Like, uh, it has something, to, I don't know. Like, I know that if there's an R number, then there are more cases coming that day, right? <laughs> Isn't that what that means? If like, there's I've never, no I, R I, number, I, there are no more I'm sorry. Cases. Oh, if okay. there's no R number. If there's no R number, there's more cases. I, you know, I just, um, I just tune in to SCOTUS blog. Uh, you know, if you're if if you're in the audience and you're and you want to know, you know, how do I follow Supreme Court decisions? SCOTUS blog is the best source, I think. And on the day of decisions, they have a live blog and they tell you, you know, what cases have come out. They link to the cases um, and to link to commentary about the cases. It's great. And then they're always talking about the R numbers. They used to talk about boxes, like if you were in person, right? How many boxes did the with the justice is holding or whatever, and that shows how many cases are left that day, because you never know how many, you know, what cases the Supreme, how many Supreme, how many cases the Supreme Court are gonna re, uh, uh, disclose on any given day. So, but I don't know what R stands for, and, yeah, I, and I don't want to know. <laughs> one of those Supreme Court mysteries. I don't know what it stands for either. I know other mysteries, but that one I don't know. Yeah, there are theories, but. Uh... Anyway, uh -huh. I, I wanted to start you off with a fun one um, before I get into I the failed. difficulty. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so it, atheists are often attacked, ironically, uh, by people who are religious, particularly Christians, as being just another religion. Um, there's even been a push recently in state legislatures to try to undermine things like same-sex marriage and reproductive rights as tenets of the religion of secular humanism. and I, I'll pause here for everyone to roll their eyes. Um, <laughs> and that because these are tenets of the religion of secular humanism, that therefore the state cannot do anything that promotes these positions. By actively trying to take advantage of the same benefits offered to the religious because they are religious, are atheists playing into the hands of those who take that position? Well, I mean, I see the danger there a little bit. Um, you know, I, I the thing, that, the the issue that I started my career writing about was that was evolution uh, and 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 uh, attempts to to teach alternatives to evolution, and that always involves. So I'll use that example, right? The exa the argument is, well, if you teach evolution in the public schools, that is the public school endorsing promoting atheism or secularism because that's a position, right? That's at odds with religion. Uh, that's just a flawed argument. Um, there, are, the government is is uh, is it's okay for the government to teach or promote or explain things that happen to um, that happen to you know have the effect of calling into question certain kinds of religious beliefs, as long as it's not a as long as the school or, or government is not stating the actual belief that there is no God. Right, and I, that's a distinction that I think is extremely important and very uh, and slippery, right? So what I always say is, you know, um, so there's uh, the government can teach evolution, right? Even though, at, in fact, the teaching of evolution is not neutral with respect to kids in the classroom and their parents who believe that God created the world 6,000 years ago. I, I, that's true, but there are lots of things the government does all the time that happen to be uh, inconsistent with things that people believe as a result of their religion, right? What the government cannot do, and I think in this way, atheism is is a is a re, is is religion for purposes of the establishment clause, right? Is that the government cannot have a school that says uh, there is no God, right? I think that is true. I don't think that the government can teach that there is no God as a matter of truth. I don't think that means atheism is a religion necessarily. It means that simply for purposes of the establishment clause, the government cannot promote that uh, viewpoint. 
but that's kind of a hard, that is a hard distinction. And by if atheists take part uh, in public life and put forward substantive views about, you know, what we believe, uh, it might be viewed as, uh, as, as, as being a religion. And then the argument might seem a little stronger for things like we shouldn't be able to teach evolution in public schools. But with a tiny bit of, uh, uh, of actual analysis, I think that latter argument falls apart. And I think the judges are, even your doofus judges, are wise enough to understand that distinction. So yeah, I, I see that danger. I see that danger. Um, I think it's, but I think it's, it's worth, you know, it's worth the risk at this point. Um, agreed. And, and I noticed you struggling with something that I struggle with a lot that um, in, in the language that I use as an attorney, but as a member of the atheist movement, where within certain legal contexts, we have to lump the atheist position in as a religious viewpoint with religion because it addresses a religious question. But then inevitably, I get the response from members from a segment of the atheist community that says, why are you calling atheism a religion? Atheism isn't a religion. And I agree, because mm -hmm. atheism is an answer to a single question. Um, but I find uh, um, sometimes it is very difficult to convey that, particularly to um, to people who haven't gone through law school and had to, you know, who aren't as masochistic as I. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that's, you know, that's a great point. And it's probably worth, you know, uh, writing about that. And 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 uh, I'm not sure I've ever quite written about it that way. But oh, no, I, uh, but yeah, here and there. But um, but yeah, no, I agree. I think that's a really that that's a that's a difficult issue that you've isolated. And, um, you know, I think the uh, the the position of that you described that some some members have is uh, certainly one that's worth you know talking about um, and and strategizing about you know from the perspective of uh, your organization right and what you think is best and uh, I can I can imagine cases where you might you know not want to talk about atheism as a religion I think you know in certain contexts constitutional contexts it is uh, even but but you know the the legal definition of religion and the definition of religion that exists outside of the law uh, can be very different. Uh, that's just a, you know, that's a, that's a function of the legal system. Religion is a word in the constitution. There are lots of words in the constitution which mean, you know, specific things within the context of the constitution and within the context of Supreme Court cases interpreting the constitution that don't mean the same thing outside of the constitutional context necessarily. So, so it's tricky, absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've joked that the legal definition of religion is the same as the definition of porn, which is, we know it when we see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I teach First Amendment, and so I, I like to tell the students about how, this, uh, uh, how the court used to, uh, the justices used to go down in the basement and watch porn, or non-porn, to decide if it's porn. I don't, I don't know what that must have been like. <laughs> I didn't get to do that when I worked there. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg um, never asked me to go watch any porn. This is my RBG figure. Uh, um, I I need to put I need to put my action figures behind me on my uh, bookshelf, but I have an Joe RGB. Biden. I don't have the Joe Biden. I have, yeah. You um, know when we went to, when we went to um, online teaching in the in the spring uh, when you know I had to teach I was teaching First Amendment and my other my marijuana law class online. Um, you know I decided to uh, engage the work of uh, engage the, the <laughs> all of my uh, various stuff. To, and action figure creatures to help me because uh, you know any, anything you can do to keep atten people's attention on this platforms are, are useful so yeah 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 um back to my prepared questions uh do the satanists have advantages in court that atheists don't have and vice versa well the satanists have a couple of they have one advantage uh, the advantage in court I guess would be that it's it's more clearly a religion in the way that we just talked about than that atheism is right there. Um, and there are different kinds of Satanism, uh, but the Satanic Temple specifically has all sorts of things that look like that. I mean, the argument that they are not a religion is very weak, I think. Um, 
you know, they have rituals, they have sacred books, they have holidays, they have uh, celebrants, they have art and, you know, they have all the trappings of, of religion. So to make the argument that, for example, uh, the, a, 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 the government could exclude Satanists but not Christians from giving an invocation is, an, is, a, is a much harder, is, it, it's, it's a harder case to make for the government than exclusion of atheists. And this, so, so that's an advantage the Satanists have from the legal perspective. They also have an advantage from the non-legal perspective, really, which is that people do have a reaction to Satanism that is visceral in a way that they do not necessarily react to atheism, right? Um, because of the symbols and the iconography. I mean, the atheist bench is one thing, and that might get under the skin of the Christians, but this, you know, uh, really pisses people off, right? And um, and so, so I do love the Satanic Temple. I'm not a Satan. Uh, uh, I don't identify as a Satanist, but I do love the Satanic Temple, um, and for that reason. I mean, they really push this the idea that the if the government's going to allow religion in public life, it's got to treat all religions equally. And and you know, people might be uh, okay with including Wicca and maybe atheism, but Satan, they go bananas. So, so Satanists have, uh, well, I'll show you uh, one other thing that I brought that the, this is my favorite thing the Satanic Temple has, oh, has ever done. This is the Satanic Children's Big Book of Activities that they, um, that they tried to pass out in Florida when this Florida county was, was giving out Bibles. And so it's like seven pages of, uh, of like, uh, uh, you know, jumbles of words like rationality and justice and stuff. And the ta the county was so mad about it, they just stopped hanging out, handing out any religious materials. But it, so that's, uh, the sat Satanists have that. Um, the atheists, you know, do, the, do we have any legal advantage over the Satanists? It's possible, you know, so far, no, not, I don't think so. It is possible that I can imagine, you know, justices and judges maybe being like, Satanism is a is a is not real, right? It's uh, uh you know they uh, the Satanic Temple is sometimes accused of being you know a troll organization, uh, a, a, a a practical joke kind of you know. Uh, they're not absolutely, but 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 I can understand why some people might think they are. Um, sort of like the flying spaghetti monster. Um, you know, I I don't imagine it that the Fly Spaghetti Monster organization is going to get much traction and sort of getting treated equally as a religion. Uh, maybe uh, there are arguments for it, but 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 they do seem more like a parody. And no, I don't think anybody would say that atheists are atheism is a parody. So um, so so that that might help atheists as a legal matter and uh, compared to, to to Satanists. Something you mentioned there um, remi uh, reminded me of a, a a case a little while ago, um, when Florida, when that Florida um, county or school district stopped allowing distribution of Bibles and whatnot because the Satanists wanted to distribute theirs, is was that decision in and of itself unconstitutional? Because I mean, go ahead. Uh, no, I don't. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's totally within the the government's purview to say, oh, well, I mean, once we learn that, yeah, when religion, you know, is uh, government support of religion to the extent it's allowed has to be extended equally to every religion. Uh, when people realize, oh, we, we now we get it. Now we get why, you know, atheists and uh, Wiccans and Jews uh, don't like it when the government supports Christianity. Uh, you know, we get it because now we're seeing, oh, the government has to support Satanism too. Oh, that's bad from the Christian perspective, right? If they wanna shut down uh, whatever program it, it, it is that, that is allowing religion into public life, that's totally fine. Um, I don't think it's unconstitutional, for example, that the Phoenix um, uh, City Council decided to stop their invocation practice rather than allow uh, two Satanists to give an invocation, um, you know, for two minutes a couple of years ago. Uh, I think I think um, you know that's not it's not hostility towards religion. It's just a recognition that there are uh, there are some uh, good reasons to keep religion out of government life. Now, Espinoza kind of you know there's a little wrinkle in Espin that Espinoza poses uh, from yesterday's decision. Uh, and you I anticipated I my follow-up. 
yeah, it's hard to know where that will, you know, where that will lead. Espinoza basically held, um, so, so as I mentioned before, in 2002, the Supreme Court said that it doesn't violate the Establishment Clause to include religious schools in a voucher program, even though it means that you know, potentially millions of dollars will be funneled from the government to religious schools. Uh, in the wake of that decision between 2002 and yesterday, uh, some government organization, you know, uh, have uh, some some legislatures and town boards or whatever who are running voucher programs uh, and the like said, well, well, we'll exclude religions from the potential set of recipients on the uh, with the idea that that we should be allowed, to, you know, that it's not discrimination against religion to exclude religion because there are uh, important you know, sort of goals and norms for keep, that, that support keeping religion out, all of the things that animate the Establishment Clause in the first place. Yesterday, the Supreme Court said that if you are running a voucher kind of program and funneling money to religious schools, I, and, and I'm sorry, funneling money to private schools, you must include religious schools in the set of potential recipients. Otherwise, it's discrimination against religion. So, so that means uh, you know that uh, that you can't a, a state city cannot run a voucher program or or any other kind of indirect aid program that uh, funnels money to private schools and does not include private religious schools as part of the beneficiary set. So that that's a big that decision was not surprising at all, given the to me anyways, given the Ohio voucher case and given the Trinity Lutheran case that was decided a few years ago, like it seemed that Espinoza was the natural next step in this line of cases. Um, I don't necessarily think Espinoza was wrongly decided more. I mean, I do think it was wrongly decided, but I think the case that was more wrongly decided was the initial Zellman case uh, that allowed, you know, religion to be a part of these programs at all. So, uh, and the reason I think that that's, un the reason I have a problem with the voucher with the, with the 2002 voucher case and all these voucher programs that do include religion is they're not at, not that government has to be entirely neutral with respect to religion, but uh, because I don't think it can be, but these, these kinds of programs are wildly uh, um, uh, benefit the religions who are established and have lots of members and lots of money, right? So what kind of schools are there in the voucher programs? They're Christian schools. They're Catholic schools. Uh, there are a couple Jewish schools in the country that receive voucher funds. There are a few Muslim schools that receive voucher funds. There are no Buddhist schools, right, that are participating in voucher programs. There are no atheist schools, although I'd love to see that right now, uh, right, as a result of Espinoza, I think if there is an atheist school, uh, right, and by that I mean not a school that teaches evolution is true, which is not an atheist school, but a school that says there is no God right? Here's your test. A, is there a God? Yes or no? The correct answer is no, right? That's what an atheist school is. And those don't exist, but they could. And if they did, they would have to be funded under Espinoza. So, you know, I don't know what the likelihood uh, of, of, those, of uh, those kind of schools coming about are, but, you know, given the change in demographics that we see already, I don't know what the what the the, the United States is going to look like in a hundred years. I think these decisions, you know, the, the Christians pushing for these decisions to get access to public life are somewhat short sighted, um, given you know the trends. Uh, like right now, okay, so most of the most of the money is running to Catholic schools and Christian schools, and a hundred years they might be running towards you know atheist schools and Satanist schools, and then right, and so I still think they would. Be a problem from the establishment class perspective, but I'd be much less, you know, practically worried about it if you ask, you know, my personal self about it. So, um, so I, you know, Espinoza right now seems seems like a really bad decision, uh, and and it is a bad decision. But it might not. But you know, 100 years from now, who knows what it'll look like? I mean, ex ex assuming there's life on Earth in 100 years, that, that that's a major assumption, I guess, <laughs> these days. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, yep. Or a sip of the market, John, that thought. That's, yeah, that's too dark even for this Sorry. conversation. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to uh, engage in some prognostication. So I'll preface okay. it by saying that Supreme Court predictions are, for the audience, uh, Supreme Court predictions are more art than science, and I would add more chance than art. Um, so 
members of the audience, please don't hold Professor Wexler to any of his predictions. <laughs> but are there particular cases and issues that we think uh, that you think that we as the atheist community should be paying particular attention to uh, that perhaps we aren't? That you aren't. Um, or, I mean, uh, any that you think are. are you know, I, I mean, I, I yeah, I, well, for one thing, I'm not. I don't want any more religion cases to go to the Supreme Court uh, at this point, right? I um, I think we need to wait till this guy's president, and uh, and other people, uh, you know, get on the Supreme Court before, uh, you know, we we get excited about bringing any cases back to the Supreme Court. Um, um, so I do think this atheist exclusion policy. I mean, I don't know what American atheists, you know, uh, position is, you know is about that i'd love to hear but if you, if you want um that's a real i think that's a very disturbing trend and i do think that the courts are not coming out correctly about it. i'm writing an article about that right now actually um so that's a case that you know we i think atheists need to continue to fight for um i don't know what else to do in the courts I, if, you, if you gave me a if you gave if you gave me a scenario i might be able to think about whether we ought to be pushing it but I'm you know I'm really wary of the courts right now and I the, the stuff is not going well in the courts right yeah the trend has not <laughs> not been favorable to say that much. <laughs> grim so um, I don't know I'd try to stay away from the courts <laughs> uh, unless you know I mean if sometimes of course it's necessary to fight in the courts and the, the lawyers the church state lawyers, you and everybody, this is an amazing group uh, of lawyers. So thank you for one thing. And, uh, you know, I watched uh, Monica Miller give the Supreme Court argument in, in the in the Cross case, right? It was her first oral argument. And there were like the three guys on the other side had like argued 100 cases in total. And she was amazing. Um, and so I'm so impressed with the, you know, Rich, Rich, Richard Caskey at AU, I, just a really incredible group of litigators and uh, who are going to, you know, do the, put forward the abs absolute best case, Seidel, FFRF. Um, uh, so, so, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, the best lawyering possible is happening. It's just that these judges, you know, Trump has put so many judges on the federal courts. The Republicans are so good at that. Uh, I'm just wary of any time there's religion in the courts these days. Fair enough. On on that happy note, um, I'm going <laughs> to toss things <laughs> back to Sam, uh, who will uh, give you some questions from the audience. Great. And I apologize for taking up 20 so minutes with, with my own questions. I hope they were enlightening. Certainly no problem with me. I'm having fun. <laughs> They're very good questions. And actually, a lot of them were questions that uh, were asked of by the audience as well. So uh, you were you were doing some of the questions and answers already before we even got to the audience. But with that, let's go ahead and get started with some good questions here. So you mentioned SSA and After School Satan, and mm -hmm. people were asking about um, resources and what the, and this might be something that Jeff can speak to too, honestly, resources and how to go about planning and organizing those clubs, uh, both in elementary and secondary schools. Um, SSA is best known, of course, for organizing at universities, but. But they do or help at, at high schools too, is, is right? Um, you know, so I, I don't have any, uh, I, I, I'm no resource for that, uh, but that, but it is, it's great that there is this organization, right? Who's, who's, that's what they do. Um, so, so, and, and, they, and they have kits to help you start the organizations. They have tips to help the, you know, how to go about um, uh, having a successful organization. I, you know, that conference I went to was, was pretty cool. Like there was some sort of big picture things about why you'd want to have secular atheist uh, groups but there was also a lot of really specific stuff about how to fundraise how to interact with uh the religious groups uh who are also uh on campus you know whether it be a high school or college um you know how to there was one panel which was great which was how to deal with that guy 
And now I actually forget what that guy was, but it was like a pain, a pain in the ass guy that, you know, groups always have. And like, so, so it's real. the point is that they, um, they have a lot of very specific, useful uh, resources that, so I would just go to Secular uh, uh, Students Alliance uh, website and, 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 and poke around there and I, they'll be delighted to talk with you. Uh, you know, if you're somebody who wants to, who's in a high school now, and there's a Christian group and you think there should be a secular group, um, you know, how to talk to your principal, you know, about how to explain the law to the, your school board, that sort of thing, uh, so that, that that you're allowed to set it up because there's some schools will fight back, right? And uh, the non-Christian nation has some examples of principals saying, I think maybe you shouldn't start that, that group here. <laughs> you know, like, you got, it's, and the thing, you know, it takes a lot of courage. Um, a lot of this stuff is uh, 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 is not easy um, to to demand as a as a religious minority, uh, you know, equal treatment by the government is something that is not for everyone. And the people who do it are extremely courageous and re should be, uh, you know, thanked and celebrated. Right? There's a reason why there are many Supreme Court and other court cases which involve challenges to church and state. Um, which, which involves separation of church and state are brought by people who are, you know, call themselves Joe, you know, um, because you, some communities you can't even, uh, you know, uh, identify uh, who you are or you will be a pariah or attacked, right? And people who, who and I'm sure you, uh, people at, at, at American Atheists have, you know, gotten death threats and that's what happens when these cases. So, so, so to the people who are thinking, you know, I'd like to maybe start a group, good for you. It's going to take a lot of, you know, it could take a lot of courage, but SSA is there uh, to support you. And I'll add, so is American Atheists. I'm sorry? What did I say? And I'll add that American Atheists as well. Oh, right. Oh, good. Right. Yeah. Oh, I thought I said something. Your, your camera is off for some reason, Jeff. I'm not sure if you know that. There you go. I okay. did know that. Um, I, I was letting you guys talk. So. Okay. So along that well, same thanks. sort of line of questioning, um, both that might also be something that Jeff can weigh in on, but people are commenting. We have a fair amount of people from Phoenix and from Arizona uh, on the call today, and they're talking about the situation that happened with the invocation there, and that they basically one time tried to stop folks from giving the invocation, another time gave a second invocation because they didn't uh, specifically invoke a higher power. Um, and, and the comment is, you know, they, they change the policy in ways that make it so that it's hard to keep combating that and showing up to do those invocations. And I guess my sort of, there was a couple other questions in there that were related and uh, Secular Arizona has a great uh, presence in Arizona, and they're having that problem. So how do we go about in these smaller towns uh, showing up and doing these invocations and making sure that our voices are heard in the public square? Well, I, I mean, I don't know if I how much uh, help I can be in the practical, you know, what to do in the particular city or town in, in Arizona. I mean, I think you know, so, and I don't know exactly what's being referred to. Uh, in, uh, um, I mean, I, I'm familiar with the Scottsdale and the Phoenix, um, or the Phoenix uh, shutting down its invocation program because of the Satanic Temple. And I know the Scottsdale um, excluded Satanists but kept going, right? And then now, now there's a suit. Uh, but I don't, I don't know uh, what's going on with the atheist invocations if there are, are atheists being excluded in, in Arizona as well? I, I just don't know. Um, you know, I, I do know that part, that one of the arguments that, that Scottsdale made, I think, is, um, right, you got to be have a presence in the community or something like that, um, a geographical nexus to the, to the town. Um, that may or may not be okay. That's a hard argument to fight against, I think. Um, but if somebody says we're excluding atheists, um, I, then you uh, call the lawyers. I think. Uh, I don't know. I'd like to hear you know more about the specifics because uh, I'm not necessarily familiar with. It. Sam, were you referring to uh, Kristen Cinema? Yeah, and uh, Athena Salmon and Juan. 
Oh, Athena Chris Solomon, right. <laughs> um, if I so, it's been a little while since I read up on it, but if I remember right, Athena Solomon was um, uh, is a member of the State House uh, of Representatives, and um, gave a humanist invocation, and then. Um, got some blowback because she had not specifically referenced the higher power and another member of the house immediately got up and gave a Christian invocation so that the Christian God was honored <laughs> from the whole floor of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the state house. Remember that. Uh, I don't know what to do about that. Like if somebody decides to give a Christian invocation after your is that unconstitutional? I don't know. Um, but, but she has given several, right? Um, uh, and yeah, they're controversial, um, but she, she gave them. I'm quoting a couple of them actually in this paper I'm writing. Uh, so, I mean, the place, there are gonna be, there's gonna be pushback in, in some places and it's just you know fighting, fighting, fighting in some, in some of these places, I guess. I don't know more about it than that though. Sorry. That's okay. Um, Love Arizona though. From... So uh, we, have, we have some questions that uh, touched back on to SCOTUS. And we have about three or four that touch on lemon and whether or not that's essentially been obliterated at this point with recent rulings or if it's still in play, I guess. Well, it's still, yeah. sorry. Um, it still exists. You know, the lemon test itself has always been fairly. Uh, my view about the lemon test is that it, it's this sort of general, you know, overarching test that itself does not play an, a role, an important role in any particular kind of controversy. That for every kind of controversy, whether it be funding of religion or the, uh, invoca I guess invocation is not a good example, um, uh, but uh, funding of religion or the monuments, you know, um, or or access to public property kind of stuff. There's always a, a, a different test that implements the lemon test. So the endorsement test, for example, in the uh, in the in the religious monuments uh, context. So so I always think, you know, it's I and I never understand if when people say we should get rid of lemon, that also means we should get rid of whatever the test has been that's developed in whatever area of law, you know, whether it be funding or monuments or whatever that that they're talking about. So that's always confused me. Like I don't even care if they got rid of lemon if it didn't mean that they were also getting rid of the lemon the endorsement test. I think that that when when they when for example in the American Humanist versus American Legion case they were talking about getting rid of lemon, they meant getting rid of the endorsement test also as a implementation of the lemon test, but they didn't get rid of it um, yet. So it still exists. Um, you know, there was that interesting, interesting dynamic, right, at the Supreme Court where you had these two different, you know, positions, the one being get rid of the lemon test, that was the, Char the, the Cooper, Charles Cooper position, and then there was uh, the Ocadio's position, which was like, we can uh, uphold this, the cross without getting rid of the lemon test and the, and the court went with that and during the oral argument they were trying to figure out you know could we replace the lemon test with some other thing like the proselytization test and nobody you know there's no good clear simple test that works in these cases because it's so they're so complicated um and there are these interests on other on various sides of the issue so i don't know i guess I, i've always not so much worried about whether the court will get rid of the lemon test per se uh, uh, and, le and, and I'm more concerned with what it what it replaces it with, if anything. Um, but so far, the lemon test exists at least in the in the uh, the monument context. I mean, it doesn't exist; it doesn't play a role in the invocation context. I don't really think it plays a role in the funding context. Uh, I don't think it plays a really a role in the school prayer context because that's the coercion test. So I, it's really I'm not I try not to focus on the lemon test. The lemon. I mean, I like how I like how like every there are a hundred law review articles that start with some title, you know, which have t a title which play, is a play on lemon. That's the thing I like most about the lemon test, like making lemonade out of lemon: colon interpreting the Supreme Court's lemon test. 
things like that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and and how how has no one stumbled on sherbet lemon? I mean, that's a great, that's a great point. But you have. That's mine. But, you can't have that. I'm writing that article. You, it's yours. <laughs> Because <laughs> sherbet might be back, right? The Supreme Court took, you know, is, is going to decide this. Uh, what's a case, case called Fulton next uh, next term about whether to overrule Smith? Um, I mean, maybe we're we, that would be too into the Scotus weeds. I don't know, but um, but sherbet could be back. What if sherbet comes back with lemons out? Then your joke doesn't work either. Yeah, that's true. All right. <laughs> Look, I'm watching the attendees is going. Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> moving back to questions, we have uh, a few questions related to Espinoza, but the one that I think is most interesting is: is there a positive spin that we can take from it? And the specific example was because they are now able to get uh, public funding, is it possible that some of their rules will change? So for instance, in the example of the question is, can they then be forced to let people start atheist groups or Satanist groups or SSAs because they're now taking public funding? We, um, I thought I was getting the, uh, the the idea until that last part. Yeah. Like, so if they're receiving public funds and it's a religious school, yeah, can the positive outcome potentially be that oh. we can force them to accommodate people such as? Okay. So right. Yeah. So that's always you know um, the argument against one of the best arguments, I think, against funding religion, and particularly religious uh, schools with government money, is that government can condition its uh, provision of funds on, you know, a variety of, of kinds of conditions, like that you can't discriminate um, on the basis of religion, for example, or on the basis of sex. Um, or, you know, who knows? Like, the, so we'll see, we'll see it's possible that, you know, the government if if more there's turns out that there's more public funding of religion and that um the government is has an appetite for placing conditions upon that funding that will interfere in some way with the religious mission of the school right um that it could result in a sort of watering down of the religious missions of the religious schools that are receiving the government money I don't, I actually, do, I mean, I guess that's a silver lining, maybe, if the Supreme Court allows it. I mean, the, 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 the issue of conditional, um, uh, unconstitutional conditions is a really hard area of the law. Um, so I'm not sure that those conditions would survive, but if they did, uh, I guess you could say they're, they're, that's a silver lining. But I, I don't really view it that way because I, I just, I don't think it's good for religion. Like, um, I'm not anti-religion, actually, even though I'm an atheist. Um, uh, and I, you know, the idea that that the government's gonna, you know, use its money to influence how religious schools teach their doctrine is not particularly exciting to me. Um, you know, I think it'd be much better to just keep the money completely out of the religious schools. So, um, but yeah, I can see how one might look at this and say, oh, there's at least a possibility that the government can use this funding. Uh, authority and the, the authority of placing conditions upon that funding to influence the religious schools in a way that some people might think is on the whole better. Uh, so I guess if you want to, if you really want to look for a ray of hope, or you could do that. I, I'm not going to, I don't feel like I am going to do that, but but I can see why somebody might. I'm, I'm highly skeptical of taking that approach of trying to require private religious schools to uh, abide by non-discrimination clauses because I have a feeling that that is a surefire way to return us to the Sherbert version of things, which for those who are unaware, um, they're probably more familiar with RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that was passed by Congress after Employment Division B. Smith specifically to reestablish they tried across the board, but 
it ended up being only in federal law to reestablish um, a strict scrutiny test where if someone's religious exercise is substantially burdened by a government practice, um, then that government practice has to pass strict scrutiny, which means that it has to be narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling government interest, which is essentially what Sherbert said back in 1960 something. Three, maybe? That's be my guess, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. Or yeah. So I think, I think <laughs> if someone brought that case, the Supreme Court's response would be uh, in a state that didn't have its own brief for statute. Mm -hmm. that this, this Supreme Court would just say Smith is no longer good law, Sherbert uh, controls. Yeah, I mean, so I don't I'm know. Skeptical. I mean, it, but it is, it is a, would be a funding condition, right, as opposed to a general law. I Does that give, the, that's a morass, right? Yeah. So, but you're right. Uh, if you just sit, sit, stand back and you look at who's on the courts, and wonder, would they allow you know this kind of thing to go? Uh, I, I can see the skepticism there. Yes. So a bunch of questions kind of rolled in as follow-ups to that. Um, there are so many. I want to have so many conversations with you, uh, <laughs> Professor Wexler, um, and I hope that we will in the future. But we'll yeah, continue, absolutely. We'll continue answering so. audience questions for the time being. So very, very, very quickly, give like a one sentence explanation of what lemon is for people who don't know what that is, since we just right, had a brief explanation on Sherbert. Uh, lemon is a test that comes from a case called lemon uh, uh, to evaluate any kind of establishment clause challenge to a law. It basically says that in order to be constitutional, the, the government law or action has to have a secular purpose. It can't have the primary effect of advancing religion, and it can't constitute an excessive entanglement with religion. So, uh, so the purpose has to be secular. The the effect of the law can't be to advance or promote religion, and the government can't get overly entangled with religion. That's what the Lemon Test basically says. You might say, "Oh, there's a test that says the government can't advance religion. Uh, why can't it put a 40 foot cross on public property?" That's a whole different. <laughs> that history. would take an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned earlier that you know the establishment clause jurisprudence is complicated, and and I think I think it is, but only because people don't like the answers that Lemon leads them to, and so they find a way to like weasel out of it, and yeah. as a result, it's Swiss cheese and has just full of holes. Yeah, and you know I don't I don't mind um, so much. Uh, the cases which, you know, some kind of come out one way for, for the government and another way against the government. Like, I don't mind like the Justice O'Connor, I don't love it, but I don't mind as, so much the sort of Justice O'Connor endorse uh, application of the endorsement test where some things are okay and some things are not okay. And that period of time where the government, where the Supreme Court was, you know, making those distinctions among aid programs, you know, books are okay, film strips aren't, that whole thing. Like to me, that was the court struggling with the really hard issues posed by um, including, you know, re, uh, having a relationship between state and government and this really big government kind of uh, society we live in. I, I, I didn't mind that so much. What I really mind is the court coming up with these basically what are now clear rules that allow so much religion into public life um, uh, because it really. Um, ignores the complexity uh, of, of, of the, the different sides of the issue uh, in a way that I find really distressing. Thank you. So we have a couple of questions that I usually hold till the end because they're sort of more logistical. For instance, how do we get a copy of your book signed by you? I already put a chat link to your book on oh, bookshop.org um, and to your website so people can find more information about you. But if they want a signed copy of your book, normally we do that at the convention. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, well, I'm d definitely happy not only to sign uh, anyone's book, but also to, uh, to draw. I always uh, draw a picture, uh, and usually it's a picture of some um, – uh, of uh, a um, anthropomorphized fruit or vegetable saying something silly. Um, but so 
Uh, in fact, I have a, a painting of an example. Uh, there's my kiwi fruit painting. I don't think you know if you can see it, but it says, I am a kiwi fruit smoking. I'm a kiwi fruit cough cough and I am delicious. Um, so I'll do that every anybody, you know, um, because I just, I love it when people buy a book of mine. It's like amazing. Uh, so I, I would do that. Um, I guess the best, uh, it's a little tricky now that I'm not, that I'm not in my office. Like if I'm in my office, you could send it, you could buy it on Amazon and have it sent to me. And then I would just sign it and then I would send it in the B, you know, the Boston University mail to you. Um, I guess you could still do, if you send me a book copy in the mail, I'll sign it and then I'll send it back to you. Um, it might not be as seamless as it would be if I was in uh, at the university. So maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe the best way is have them email you and figure it yeah, out. Yeah, if you email me and say, hey, I'm sending a book to you, will you, will you uh, uh, sign it and send it back? Uh, I will do that. Excellent. Unfortunately, I have your book on my Kindle, so that's uh, not really an option. Yeah, no, that's it. <laughs> <Kindle's laughs> sign the screen. <laughs> I saw like, I had a Kindle, which had a, like, there was a special cover for a Kindle, which allowed people to sign. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> so send me your Kindles. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so I think we made it through most of the questions. And somebody's suggesting maybe a book plate and then sending that to people. So we'll, we'll work that oh, out. Oh, that's a good idea. Out. Yeah, right. That's a good idea. What? Like I could just get a yeah. sticker. I'm sure they make those, right? And then I sign it and then I, mm -hmm. that's another, I'll do that too. So uh, there will be, we've had some questions about whether this is recorded, it is recorded. And we will make sure that in the follow-up link, uh, follow-up email that you'll get tomorrow, you'll have a link to the recording. I'll also put some of these links into that email as well as um, uh, some ways to get in contact with Jay, including Twitter and email and things like that um, so that people can follow up with you directly if they have more questions or want you to come speak at their groups or anything like that. And um, just a reminder that tomorrow we have a webinar at 3 o'clock p.m. and it is on understanding Espinoza and it's with Andrew Sabell from uh, FFRF and Allison from American Atheists and Nick Little from CFI should be a much more in-depth conversation of, of the findings there. So if you didn't get your questions all answered, there'll be many more chances to have questions answered. Um, and then next Wednesday, we have Jennifer Driver is joining us to talk about uh, sex ed and what we can do to work with the secular community. And uh, she's coming from CECUS. And I'm sure she will also be talking about SCOTUS rulings <laughs> during her talk. Um, so stay tuned and we'll, we'll get you those links and emails as well. So with that, I want to thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Jay. You're very welcome. Thanks so and much for giving inviting me. Give you a chance me. to wrap up anything else you want to say. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, there will there, there are two more religion cases that the Supreme Court is going to decide uh, probably next week. So look for those. They probably won't come out too good. Yeah, they said <laughs> Monday is an opinion day, so. Although they still have the nine, last one? no, they have seven or eight decisions left to announce. So if they keep to their one to three opinions a day, uh, we might be going well into well into July. Um, so I should mention that on July 29th, we'll be having a SCOTUS wrap-up <laughs> webinar with Jeff what? and Andrew Torres. And we thought that was late when we scheduled it, but it turns out it's probably just about right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so. We'll Unless they do do one there. every yeah. Monday, in which case it'll be August. <laughs> oh, I think I can handle that. <laughs> oh, and I did. I was going to ask you about uh, the experience of trying to download Bostock after Alito attached his. <laughs> oh, his yeah, his thing from yeah. Megabytes of appendices, but <laughs> we can talk about I, that off. I think I waited. I waited uh, until I saw that it was uh, it was fixed up. Okay. The website they broke their own website. <laughs> so excellent i will make sure that everybody gets those links and that information so they can follow the good work that you're doing and you. uh, access your we talked about your one book but of course you have other books as well and other work that you're doing and of course your twitter 
SCOTUS Humor, at SCOTUS Humor. Go follow you and follow me. Uh, follow you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Follow you. And follow me. I'm at Blackwell, at Blackwell ESQ. Um, on Twitter, so feel free to follow me as well. I never, I never plug my Twitter because I virtually never tweet. But go ahead. <laughs> I will. He's just trying to get that bottle of scotch. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last thing I wanted to mention, because people are putting it in the chat, uh, because we did mention SSA and you did talk about their convention. They are have moved their convention online on the week of July 22nd. They're having a virtual conference this year. So if you're interested in hearing more about the good work they're doing, we do have Allison speaking at that, and there's a huge lineup of other really wonderful speakers. So make sure you check them out as well. Terrific. So. All right. Well, excellent. thank you so much. Have a good night. Go atheists. <laughs> <laughs>